Hi, it's Kelly here, and it's been a while since I made a video, and I'm going to explain that in a little bit. I've got three topics I want to talk to you about, and then after that, I will tell you about my health condition. Uh, first, I want you to find, see why I'm actually wearing a pearl necklace, because it's kind of embarrassing, and I, I figure if I, if I don't make it and they find me here at home, dead in a doornail, and I'm wearing pearls, they'll start to wonder. Uh, and so let me tell you about that first. Uh, there's a registered nurse that I know who years ago, a long time ago, she worked for an orthopedic surgeon. And one of the patients had double knee replacement surgery done. And typically at that time, when the surgery maybe was more invasive, patients would come in in a month on a walker when they had their follow, you know, one of their follow-up appointments on a walker. And uh, so this one patient, she had the double re knee replacement surgery, and her brother proceeded to give her pearls to wear around her neck, on her wrist and, and ankles. I don't have them around my wrist and ankles, but I do have them here uh, around my neck. So she shows up at the doctor's office a week later without a cane. She walks in under her own power a week later. So apparently, pearls have some ability to heal joint issues. Now, I don't know about that helping me because I have a metal rod in my back, and the issue that is generated in my, in my uh, lower leg has to do with the veins, but I figure, why not? Why not? Um, so anyway, I'm wearing pearls. <laughs> and I hope that, you know, if, if you have any kind of uh, joint issues, you might try wearing pearls. I don't wear them outside. No, sir. <laughs> I don't feel comfortable doing that. Uh, but I wear them here at home. But I realize, oh my gosh, you know, I don't go, you know, I, I could die right here. And they would find me with pearls on and that'd be a lot, I wouldn't be able to explain it to them. <laughs> So it's up to you to explain to everybody why I'm wearing them. <laughs> All right. So the other thing is uh, a topic I've touched on before because we've got uh, we've got some cooler weather uh, coming in. I don't know. It might be might be 65 or 70 degrees and quite breezy. And here in northern Florida, I've seen people wearing heavy coats because that's the way the Floridians are. They wear heavy, yeah, as soon as it gets the least bit chilly, they're wearing a heavy coat. And I would be wearing something too, but I went out today with this light shirt on and shorts, uh, no hat uh, and no socks, and uh, feeling just fine. It was, it was pleasant, you know? And uh, I you, you might have heard me talk about the experiment that I did as a test pilot a few years ago. We had during the summer, um, it was 99 degrees for two weeks straight. And so I did it as a test pilot. I was wearing stuff like this in my clothing. And I was wearing long pants, uh, two shirts, and a wool vest. And I had stuff like this and, the, and those little discs, you know, the two inch discs that some of you might have. Um, in my pockets, in the shirt pocket, the vest pockets, and I was wearing a wool cap with this kind of stuff in it. So I was a sight for sore eyes, and, you know, walking around. I must I had to have looked like the craziest person in the store that day, every day that I did that. Um, but And everyone else, of course, was talking about the hot, hot weather. It was like, it was like oh, unbearable, you know, because it gets humid here, too. So 99 with the humidity. It's really tough, and people, it's the first top, first words out of people's mouths what, if you're standing in line. But I, it always caught me off guard because I didn't feel hot. I felt warm, I felt comfortable, and I, I was perspiring. Um, but it, it just kind of would catch me off guard. Then I realized, oh yeah, I got the gear on. And, uh, and that was that. And then, one evening, the temperature dropped down to 90 degrees. That's a 90 degree drop. In the evening, it was about 7 o'clock. And I went outside, and I didn't go 20 or 30 yards. 
and I told a friend who was with me, because I didn't have the gear on, didn't think about it, and I said, my God, this is irritating. The sun just felt my, I felt like my skin was burning up. And then it dawned on me that I didn't have all this stuff loaded up in my, all my pockets, you know, shirt, top shirt pocket, uh, you know, other pockets. I think at the time I had a shirt, uh, cargo pockets on both sides, pants front and back, cargo, cargo pants, uh, pockets, and, uh, and then the hat. And I was comfortable. But I wasn't comfortable when I went outside without it, even though the temperature was significantly lower. And that's, it, it, it dawned on me then as well that it's not the sun that was making people feel hot and irritated. It is the electromagnetic fields that we're all subjected to that have become increasingly uh, more prolific, I could, might say, as more and more 5G has gotten added. I think when I did this, we didn't have 5G here in this city. They were get, but at some point it got it. It's here as well, along the, the, the major roads that go from town to town. Um, so, but we're just, we're just souped up in it. You know, it's, we've got the computers running. We've got, we've got the Wi-Fi. A lot of us have that. I don't have that. I have Ethernet, um, you know, the, the cell phones, the cell towers, the cell masts, the, the smart beaters, you know, the, people call them smart meters, but they're actually beaters because they have both AC and DC. So they have a pulsed rate, which makes it particularly harmful. And uh, so I handled the heat just fine, and I'm handling the cold just fine at least the cooler weather, I should say. And I want to tell you, uh, to add to this, you know, if you go back a couple hundred years uh, during the Revolutionary War, there's the famous Valley Forge, and I've actually had a chance to visit there, the actual grounds where the soldiers stayed. And there were 12,000 soldiers that stayed there that winter and into the spring. Uh, they stayed there about five or six months, maybe longer. And it was quite cold, they had a lot of snow, and the places that they slept, this is what just like, boom. It was like a, the size of a, you know, a bunk bed, a little bit wider because it had walls on three sides. And then the fourth side was wide open, and that's where they slept. So all the elements got in there, and they, you know, the cold, they did not have, they didn't have, uh, you know, fireplaces, they didn't have centralized heating. They didn't have any of that. And then out of the 12,000 that were there, oh, and I must mention to you as well, one of the generals wrote a letter asking for help because he said some of the men don't have hats, some don't have shoes, some don't have coats. So these people are used to going around barefoot and without hats and, you know, without, without uh, heavy gear up north, and not just for a day or an afternoon or five minutes, but for day after day, week after week. And out of the 12,000 that were there, 10,000 survived. Now, let's go to today. How many people, I can tell you here, looking around at the people all dressed up in their warm coats, with the temperature, you know, being in some places, you would consider that a gift. You have 70 degree weather, right? And it might have been 80, I'm not sure. It was, just, it was a strong breeze. Um, none of us would survive a week sleeping in, in those conditions without having a fire going. And they could tell that they didn't have any fires there in front of uh, where they were sleeping. And even if they did, how would they keep them going for, you know, the whole night? night after night for six months. Where, where, where would they even get the firewood? Uh, plus they had the stress. It's not like they had a lot to eat. They had the stress of the British not knowing if the British might be coming to kill them. So they were under a tremendous amount of stress and worry in the unknown. And they were in, in living conditions that we would consider to be, you know, like living in the caves, you know, 10,000 years ago. And yet these people 
10,000 out of the 12,000 lived through it. Today, not one in a hundred would make it. So, and it's be, not because of their diet, they didn't have a great diet, they didn't have enough, a lot of food, low stress, they had plenty of stress, shelter from the storm, didn't have any of that, and yet they survived. And it's because they weren't subjected to the electromagnetic fields. I'm saying all this to stress to you, to you the importance of us protecting ourselves and having these things stationary, are, it's not enough. They've got to be spinning. Now, I, it's good to have them on you as well as you go around doing what you're doing. That's fine. You know, you, you probably don't want to wear them in your hat and things like that, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, I would suggest you carry some of these in, in your pockets. But in addition, you want to have these, the bigger ones, and, I, and I'll provide a link down below. Uh, this is a this is a 200 millimeter or eight inch plate disc. Uh, it's, I think on the website it's called an antenna. Um, it comes. This red thing is added here. I have, see. I actually have two of them. The reason I have them free like this is that I had a fan, or these were running on, but I had these two things on there, and I had some other stuff that were heavy, and finally the fan gave out after four years. And it was running all the time, just about all the time. Um, so I I'm, I'm using them now. I'm tucking them in, when I sleep at night by my sides, and I'll have them behind my back and in my, and in my you know, under my shirt here while I'm sitting here. Let me stick it under here while I'm talking to you. Uh, just to, you know, anything I could do to kind of boost things up. Um, anyway, so that's that story. Now the other stories, these are incredibly powerful stories that I want to share with you. Uh, and, and, and don't let the numbers get in the way because, because there's just a, a few numbers. All right, and, I mean, a couple. And, and I've talked about this in one video before, and it's about how the the sun and the moon are able to lift the ocean up in the form of waves, right? Because the water would be flat, but the but if you go to the beach, there's oftentimes waves, and depending, you know, if there's some wind and what creates the wind other than the sun and the moon and the stars, when you get right down to it, creates all of that. You've got waves, and if it's, you know, you could have 10-foot waves. So I'm picking 10 feet because it's just a, an easy number to work with. So if you take a cubic foot, which is about like this, let's see, this is, one of these discs was eight inches, so a little bit bigger. A cubic foot, you know, foot by a foot by a foot, three dimensions. And you filled it with water, it would be 62 pounds. And the sun and the moon are lifting that water up because there's a wave there instead of it being flat. If the wave is 10 feet high, well, let's say 15 feet high, the average, you know, so now let's just go 10 feet. Just pl go along with me on this. We've got 10 cubic feet of water because the wave is thick, right? So 10 feet times 62 pounds would be 620 pounds. So the sun and the moon, without any arms, without any legs, without any motors, doesn't know, they don't have motors, is able to lift 620 pounds just in that one space. And then you could go to the, you know, to the left or the right, however long that wave is, and it's lifted all that water up just through frequencies. That's how strong frequencies are. You know, if you blow up a bomb and you're not hit by the bomb, but the frequency of it can throw you through the air. That's a frequency. But now we're just looking at the water. It's strong enough to lift that up in the air. Right? Now, the reason I'm telling you about this is because I, I want you to understand I, just this, the power of the sun and the moon, 
and the water, but you, you, and me, because we're 70% water. And if you're standing at the edge of the beach and you're not in the water to move you, you won't sway back and forth. Even though all those frequencies are, are pulling the water up, and you can be sure that, that frequent, those frequencies are enveloping the beach as well. You know, where you're standing, or maybe if you're on a, you know, if you're on a pier above it, and the water's coming in below you, those frequencies are passing through you and lifting the water up, right? So you, those frequencies are penetrating you, and you're 70% water. So yet, you are not swayed. You don't get moved from side to side as each wave crashes in. So you must have a counter force inside of you, right? That is balancing that. And I want to show you, I, I should have brought this book over here, so if you'll, I'm going to st step away from the screen here, or roll away from the screen here to show you uh, what I'm talking about, if I can find the book here easily. Where is my book? I've always got it in different places. Well, all right, you guess I don't know where it is. So, um, it's the, I wanted to show you the drawing, and some of you have seen this before, of a microtubule. And a microtubule is a tiny, tiny thing inside the nucleus of your cell. Now you can see with, with a microscope, I guess the kind you would have in high school or college, you can see cells with a microscope. I believe you can, as I remember. It's been a long time, <laughs> right? Now you, you, you might be able to see the nucleus too with a, with a high school grade microscope. But now we're talking about inside of that nucleus is this tiny, skinny, skinny little thing it's, it's kind of like a snake, you know, the way it winds. And it moves all around, different, different shapes. It's called a microtubule. I don't think they show up on a high school or maybe even a college microscope. They're so tiny. And the, the diameter of them, because they're in tubes, is the same as your DNA. They are shaped in a coil shape and they run on voltage and each and every one of your cells has this voltage and I'm going to propose to you that those microtubules as well as the other coiled things that are in your body such as your DNA which is also coiled spiral shape are the have the energy in it to withstand all of the electromagnetic fields that can move, lift the ocean. And if you think about it, 620 pounds, think of a, a, a barbell. If you were trying to lift a 620 pound barbell off the floor, most people cannot do that. You can, your heavy power lifters can do it. You know, 500 pounds, uh, maybe, you know, even more elite, 600, I think that the around a thousand pounds, somewhere in that area would be the, I don't know what the world record is, it could be above that some amount, but extremely few people can lift 620 pounds off the floor. And yet the sun and the moon can lift the ocean and they do it without, without breaking a sweat. Right? We break a sweat. <laughs> so we have a power within us that is equal to the power of the sun and the moon combined. And to resist what's going on. So it's a very potent, potent thing. And, it, and obviously, it can do a lot of different things. There's, there's videos I've seen where you can, it just shows all, all the intricacies of what, what is involved with this little microtubule that's in the shape of a, a snake, I call it a, a flute because you know, if you straighten it out, it's got little fingers that run across it. And they have found that there's fluids level, different, like 
one area of fluid and another area of fluid that kind of surrounds the inner area of fluid or water flowing through. And water is a, is a wonderful conductor. It's like on a scale of zero to, you know, point zero zero one to, to uh, one. Water is one. Or if you went to a thousand, I, I'm not sure what scale they use. Water is a conduct is a thousand rating of conducting. So nothing better than water for conducting. And so this little tiny thing, and it's all uh, is that powerful. And it does a bunch of different things. And so we use it generally for keeping our body running and, and making you know making our DNA being constantly replaced because we keep making new cells millions a minute. And so, but they may have other abilities too. You know, we, like if we, if we think a happy thought, we, our brain makes a peptide and that peptide is transmitted down to our organs. And the, it's it, it created by an emotion and it goes to the organ. If you have a negative thought, it creates a different kind of peptide that goes to your organs. So it can make the organs unhappy. And an unhappy organ, you know, they say stress, translate that to stress, right? Stress promotes illness. Happiness, joy promotes wellness. So we have this, I wanted to give you this concrete thing. And, and the reason I'm telling you all this is that, you know, I really don't know with the way the shape of my leg is and the condition that it's going in, how long I will be around. Um, I've been dealing with this for six months. It was getting better to where it, used to, it was burning all the time, but not so bad. Sometime, you know, during the day, evening time would burn a little bit more. Um, but gradually by taking a, a lipidic, a liposomal vitamin C and some other stuff, I got it down 90%. And then it just, it's very co it cost, it's costly. And so I started, not taking as many, and for about a week or two until I got it got in what I needed, and I've been taking it for a couple of weeks, and I haven't. Instead of going back to where you know it's gradually getting better, at this point it's it seems to be problematical. And I've tried eight different kinds of lotions and oils and, and various things. Uh, some of them worked for a few days and then seemed to be like I got a vino that's a brand name and it was working for a couple of days and it then it started making like valleys and mountains of redness on my leg so I didn't think that was such a good idea because I was thinking that's like scar tissue and once you get scar tissue then you have further impaired function so um and I also get areas that look like they, they want to turn into wounds. And I've been able to keep that down. Uh, my chiropractor, who's an acupuncturist, who's been doing it for 45 years, the acu acupuncture. His father, I believe, was an acupuncturist, so, or, or was a uh, chiropractor, so he actually started learning chiropractic when he was 12 years old, believe it or not. This is back in the day. You couldn't get away with that today. But back, this is, you know, you go back 45 years, people did things. So, uh, he said, what did he say? Oh, he said, well, one thing he says, I need to walk at least, first he wanted me to walk 20 minutes a day. And the, the truth is, the matter is I can walk about 15 seconds to 30 seconds. And it's not that a muscular thing that's causing me to have to stop walking. It's because... My pelvis is, the top part of my pelvis is slightly above the bottom of my spine. So it's putting pressure on the nerve. It makes it difficult for me to continue walking. I have to stop and then go. And, and obviously, that, it's kind of a vicious circle because, you know, I've been sitting for about 12 years, longer than that maybe, uh, most of the time. And so my muscles are not as strong as they could be. And so, yeah, and so maybe I could improve a little bit, but, it, but this structural thing that's a bone with a metal rod holding it in place, 
so it's not like it's going to budge. And so anyway, and the glory of all this is that our job in life is to heal the world and to, you know, to, to help the world. And it isn't to live forever. So, you know, at some point I'm going to check out. And the way this thing is going is it could happen soon. I don't know. It might not happen for 20 years, you know, which is a dreadful thought in my mind, I, I have to admit, because I think, well, how much better can it get? And how much longer do I have to put up with the daily grind of the discomforts and, and limitations that I have? So I have that working against me too, mentally. And so, and that's, that's being a human being. We, we do that, I'm not perfect. Um, so I want you to have this information in a format that if you can understand it, that you can live it and maybe even transmit it, or if, you, if that's not possible, to share it with, who, you know, with whomever uh, you can, because I believe this is valuable information. I mean, it was a little bit off the wall. I'm sure that nobody else has said these kinds of things. And yet, the truth of it is really easy to grasp. You know, from the weight of the water to the fact that the soldiers lived in the coldest of cold and the wet snow. Uh, you know, they couldn't change their clothes all the time. It's not that they got fresh laundry, so they had wet clothes and, and uh, you know, so it would be hard on the skin. You would think they would be getting infections and things like that. I mean, they would be pr prone to them. And yet, despite that, their body was able to fend it off even though they didn't have the ideal. And it, you know, when it's 20 degrees outside, are you going to dip your feet in the water? You have to break the ice and dip your feet in the water? Are you got, you know, they, they didn't, I don't know how often they bathed back then. You know, if, if they lived in a house maybe once a week and they didn't really bathe in the wintertime too much, I don't know. But they didn't, and yet they survived. And they were survived enough that they could fight and be shot at. Cannons being shot at them, you know, and, and loading guns and carrying backpack, ruck packs, whatever they carried, you know, boat going across the Delaware, and all that stuff that they were doing. Uh, I'm sure the cold weather come, wind coming across the Delaware River on Christmas Eve was not balmy, right? But they, they handled it. And we don't, we don't, we're not able to handle it because our electricity, including our voltage powered microtubules that make our DNA are being interfered with constantly. I mean, the truth of it is when, if, if you're old enough, you walk in front of the TV or the radio that was plugged in and, 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 and the radio would become like static, right? Because your body was picking up the signals going, it was bouncing off of you or penetrating you going through your sweat glands. And so now we have a million times more, than that. it's actually more than a million times more of that energy going through us. It's a wonder that we are able to function as well as we do, although if you look around, you realize that people are not functioning very well. Their health is not great. Uh, so please take this stuff to heart. Uh, oh, yeah, so, oh, some of you are wondering why I haven't made videos. It's because, you know, dealing with this stuff, I, I get a little depressed sometimes. Plus, I got this new camera, and I, I need to take it back to Walmart because, as you can tell, the picture is shitty. Oh, pardon my language. <laughs> I don't know how to edit, so that's... Anyway, uh, you know, so I don't even know if you can stand watching me this long. Uh, wouldn't that be a shame? <laughs> Maybe somebody... I don't know if it could be remastered. I, I don't know, you know. It's so ironic, so ironic that a person of, with so few resources and I have so much information to give and so little time to give it and 
um, you know, and, and then I'm an imperfect deliverer of the information because, you know, I, I have ADD, which is part of the brain, or part of the back injury. I've had it all my life. Uh, I've had tremors my whole life that haven't improved or gotten worse or better. You know, I remember my whole adult life, at least, uh, having them. Uh, whenever I get in a stressful situation or, or uh, you know, sometimes it's dietary, but, uh, you know, I get that. And my eyes dart around. I don't know if you ever noticed that. My eyes dart around. All these things from a back injury. You, would, you know, you think, oh, back injury, yeah, he's, he's going to have sciatica or whatever. It's a whole lot more. It's a hundred times more. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to share this just so, so that you can have empathy and understanding if you have somebody in your life who's dealing with this sort of thing. Um, in my case, my manual dexterity is bad. In high school, I took a manual dexterity test, manual dexterity test, and I, I got a, it was a two percentile. That's the worst. 198% was the best. I thought I was having a good day. So I'm thinking that maybe that's connected too that because my, fa my family's athletic. I'm pretty athletic despite that I played football in high school even though I had a broken back when I was a year old. All right, And I could play basketball pretty good and I remember a friend of mine describing said I was a graceful on the court. You know? But I... I I could never, at any time, child or adult, could I, you know how you bend over and you touch your toes without bending your knees? And I used to be skinny at one time. I could not do it. I've never been able to do that. So there's all those sorts of things. And so if you have somebody with a, you know, a, a metal rod in their back and a limited, if they drop something, it's like, oh, now I got to walk into the other room, and walking into the other room isn't that much fun. Get my grabber so I can pick it up, right? And some things pick up easily, some things don't. And this happens, to me at least, several times a day. So there's that. There's getting out of this chair is a struggle, not only because of the physical aspects of it, but because and I've only, in the last year or two, become really aware of this. I forget what it is I'm about to do. So <laughs> I'll, I'll start to get up, and, and I, it's like, oh, or there's some aspect of where my feet need to be or, or whatever. And, I'll, and I won't get up. So I'm sitting there, and it's like, I'm, you know, time, the seconds go by, the minutes go by, and I'm sitting there not moving. So, and, it, and I realized, well, that's just who, that's just the life that I've been given. There's maybe, I believe in you know, karma, which means that, you know, everything is recorded and, and, and that it gives me an opportunity to heal all of that and to forgive all of that so that any sins that I have committed, hope that I can clear it and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, because that's what God wants. I, the God that I believe in, that's, that's the way I think it works. Am I wrong? We'll find out. We'll find out. Uh, if some people don't believe, they think karma is, oh, that's a terrible thing. And it just, karma just means work. Or dharma means work. Karma means something else. But it's like work. But it's like well, how much money you have in the bank. How much money? And I have found it to be true over and over and over again in my own life that, you know, uh, you know, and so anyway, it's all right. This is what I've chosen, this life, and, <clears throat> and it's, uh, the and, and it's enabled me to, you know, come up with these things, uh, be aware of, maybe because I've sat so in front of the computers for so long that I've picked up a lot of materials and, you know, connected the dots. 
So in that sense, it's like, oh, this is what I needed to do in order to come up with that. So I feel real grateful about that. I wish I would have done it another way, but you know, the people who don't have my life experience, who have a healthy back, and they're running here, there, and everywhere, and, and, and they're, looking f they're looking for the joy because I'm, no matter who you are, your mind never shuts off, right? And so you get, so you have that life. And some people have really mastered that, and they've done really, really well. And I bless them and say, God bless you for what you've been able to do. And I wish that I could have done some of those things. I'm not sure that, uh, with, that I would have done those things if I hadn't been plopped down in this chair to find the answers. And it's given me a little bit of sympathy for others. And, you know, my back was broken when I was a year old uh, by a nanny while my parents were away. And uh, see the karmic thing, so it could have been, maybe I did something in my past life that said, all right, here's what here's what you did now you're going to get a chance to learn about the other side of what you did so I really can't complain because you know I might have done some bad things pretty sure of it I've done some bad things <laughs> in this lifetime I've been mean to people I've done a lot of bad things you know nothing hopefully nothing criminal <laughs> <laughs> There's so many laws that I probably broke one or two somewhere along the line. Uh, so anyway, I got a speeding ticket a couple times, so I broke the law there. Uh, yeah, I made a left turn where there was no left turn allowed. Uh, I didn't realize it because it wasn't paying. I, I'd done it many times at the same place because it was one of these areas where there's no traffic at night. And I wasn't, I just never noticed that there was no left turn. <laughs> so finally, a uh, policeman stopped me and told me, I, I think, I don't remember if he gave me a ticket or not. I think he did. So anyway, um, I got off track. So, hey, if you want to know more about this, it's in my book. You know, I'm never going to get rich if I wait this long to, to do my advertising. Let me get this book here. Oh, my goodness. See, that's the part of it. See, what before in the camera, it would show up the title clearly from way back there. And as soon as I got this camera, the orders for my book dropped 50%. Got cut in half. You see, say, you can't even read it now with it. I'm, it's, is there a question that heals instantly? Is there a question that heals instantly? It's a brilliant book. And it does heal instantly. And it's hardwired in your brain so that your brain will, will allow you to heal. You know all those, pepti those, those bad peptides that make your organs unhappy and stressed? It automatically stops that process each and every time you do it. It's available exclusively on Amazon. Is there a question that heals instantly? There's this paperback version and there's a Kindle version. And if you order the book, you'll be able to see the picture of the hummingbird more clearly. And it's a beautiful picture. I am, I did pay uh, royalties or whatever for the artwork, you know, to have permission to use it on the cover. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get these to carry on your person. Get the bigger ones to put on fans. You can also take copper wire and, and twist them. I've, I've made other videos about that, so I won't talk about that here. But I hope that the, the water example will will just make a huge impression on you on how powerful you are. Those tiny little microtubules, instead of having to build, you know, to make you strong, you don't have to be the size of the tower, the, 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 where is it, the Giza, I'm trying to think of the, 
what do they call that? The Giza Plateau uh, pyramids, you know, which is so heavy. Well, what we're doing by spinning them, spinning this copper, is we're using elegance, just like the Wright brothers used elegance and finesse to get their plane off the ground. They didn't try to get a bigger motor. The guy that used, there was several people, but the guy who was funded by the Smithsonian Institute, and they spent over a million dollars, I think, his plane with a big heavy motor went kaplush right into the Potomac River because he tried to use brute force. Your body uses finesse. Your body uses ex uh, elegance. And what your body doesn't have, you can, re you can fill in with pearls. <laughs> so anyway, you take care and God bless.